Uh, we're running uh, a little behind right now. So we're gonna jump right into our connected car panel and then we will have a product demo just afterwards. So uh, without further ado, I'm happy to welcome up uh, five people with five different backgrounds all in the automobile transport industry. Uh, we've got Uber, we've got Bosch, we've got Jaguar. If you haven't seen, we actually brought a car. I don't know if you've noticed it over the past three days, but we brought a connected car. Um, so we've got uh, Jaguar here, and we've also got two startups working in the connected car space, Ulu and Dash. So let me welcome up all five of my connected car panelists, and let's give them a big round of applause. Somebody had too much fun last night. I wish. <laughs> Okay, um, since there's a lot of us, why don't we start off with introductions? Uh, Carl? Sure. So my name's Carl Smith. Uh, I'm product marketing and planning manager at uh, Jaguar Land Rover in the connected car space. Um, I get the privilege to work in with two great iconic brands, uh, some great products. As uh, Liam said, I'm not sure whether you noticed the Jaguar just on the side there, it's a little thing. Carl was running products. late, so he just parked it there and yeah. came up. <laughs> Absolutely. And then I get to work in one of the, probably the most exciting spaces, in my biased opinion, uh, the connected car uh, at the moment. Um, so my role at Jaguar Land Rover is about uh, bringing those uh, connected experiences to the market and then working with our engineering teams and our, um, our marketing teams to define the strategy and bring future features into the, uh, into the vehicle as well. Great. Okay. Frank. Hello. So I'm Frank Aznav. I work for Bosch. I'm a marketing and innovation director. Um, Bosch is uh, the number one supplier in the world. Uh, but we are known for, uh, for, for some products, especially in aftermarket, for example, for windshields and so on. But we do uh, many, many things like uh, diesel injection, gasoline injection. But we work on the three technologies of the future. First is uh, powertrain electrification, which is very important uh, in order to reduce consum uh, consumption, pollution, and so on. Second is uh, connected car. And third, it's also linked to connected car. Uh, it's ADAS, it's uh, uh, automatization, driving automatization uh, towards autonomous driving, which is the last step of uh, automatization. So it means the car uh, uh, drives by itself. Okay. So these are the three key challenges, and we discussed for sure with Jaguar Land Rover. Uh, there's a stereo video camera which has been introduced by uh, Jaguar Land Rover in order to make uh, uh, automatic emergency braking, and this is a Bosch product. So uh, we are very proud of this cooperation. And also, uh, we have another cooperation for uh, connectivity with uh, uh, Jaguar Land Rover because we uh, have a smartphone uh, connectivity solution for cars. Uh, and this product is called MySpin for Bosch, MySpin, My Smartphone Integration, and at Jaguar Land Rover, it's called In Control Apps. So a great product, and, uh, and we are very happy to, to work together, and probably we will share more today uh, about it. Hey, everyone. I'm Brian Langle, the co-founder and CTO of Dash. At Dash, we're building a connected car platform you take a low-cost piece of hardware, you plug it into your car, it connects with Bluetooth to your iPhone or Android phone, and while you drive gives you savings of cost, of uh, fuel efficiency, if something goes wrong with your car, we tell you in real time what it is, how much it should cost, and where to get it fixed from trusted mechanics nearby. We've got about 200,000 drivers today, about 70% in the US and 30% in uh, kind of EU, and so I'm very excited today to talk about the connected car uh, space. Hi, uh, my name is Joost Wegenel. From I'm the co-founder and CEO of Ulu. Uh, similar to my neighbor here, we're also in a startup in the connected car space. We focus on enabling businesses to adopt, uh, adopt telematics faster and quicker. We also have a device, a cloud platform, and mobile applications to support, uh, to support, to support them uh, in understanding how they drive, where they drive, but more importantly, to enable businesses to 
create new business models around smart mobility, uh, etc. So that's what we do. Hello, my name is uh, Pierre Dimitri. I'm in charge of uh, Western Europe for Uber, the mobile app. Um, Uber right now is uh, present in 300 cities around the world and I think uh, we're trying to play an active role in this uh, transition that I'm sure we'll discuss uh, from a model where everyone owns a car today to a model where the cars become something you can use on demand through an app for instance. So, so we've got a lot of different people with a lot of different perspectives, uh, whether it's suppliers of the industry, the industry itself, uh, the consumer side, the enterprise side, or even I don't even I don't actually know where to put Uber in this relationship be, because I think Uber had an idea I feel of what they wanted to do and then they accidentally enabled every car to become a connected car because they gave all their drivers phones as an obligation of using the service uh, and that was a pretty uh, amazing uh, moment I think when all of a sudden every car became a connected car and uh, and that's very interesting uh, because it benefits neither the consumer i.e. the owner I mean outside of the Uber service you guys have a lot more city data traffic, um, which, which is sort of an unintended or eventually intended consequence, but initially I can't imagine that you guys started and said, we'll build a taxi service around the world and, and accidentally find out a lot more about the connected car industry. Um, but, but what I want to know is, why, why does the car need to be connected? What's wrong with the car that we had to connect it? Can it just be a car? No. <laughs> so why can't the car be connected? I I mean, why can't it be unconnected? Excuse me. So I think, I think if we asked consumers today, actually, well, in fact, when I talk to people and tell them I'm in a connected car, a Jaguar Land Rover, I just tend to get met with a blank expression. They don't really understand, actually, um, that the car is connected to the internet or will be connected to the internet, and they don't even necessarily see a reason why, actually, it would do that. However, I think what they do expect is that their car should operate like their smartphones. Um, and they don't see why, you know, the, the infotainment system can't be updated. They don't see why um, they couldn't be notified of some diagnostic problem with, with the vehicle. So I think although they don't necessarily understand or people understand um, that it's, it's, there's a, necess a necessity to have the vehicle connected, um, I think they understand the, the, you know, the user cases that, that would lead to it. Uh Personally, I think we, first we need to be careful because, um, for example, the Institute GPA in France has made a study on the first quarter um, uh, to uh, 4,000 drivers in France. 66% of French drivers on a smartphone. So, at today, the car is not connected by itself, but connectivity comes to the car, first point. So why uh, the car needs to be connected or through the smartphone or through an embedded system? It's to bring value to the driver uh, and also to passengers during uh, their trip. So uh, we see uh, today many people using smartphones for navigation, for example, with Google Maps, Waze, and so on, because it gives value, because they, they, they want to understand uh, what they can find on, the, on their way, uh, how is their way, is it clean, not, yeah, are there traffic jumps, and so on. First, basic information. And if you look at maps uh, uh, embedded in uh, infotainment systems, generally they are not connected. So if car makers want to uh, provide similar uh, value in uh, maps data, they need to have car connected. If not, the information uh, or the maps data used by drivers come from smartphones. So this is the first basic step. And once you have connectivity inside the car, you can as well build up new services uh, towards drivers and in combination between driver profile and car uh, data. Yeah, I think it's a great point. It's really about making the car smarter and whether that's from bringing data from the outside world into the car, there's also the other side of this connected car which is taking data from the car that's historically been kind of siloed off into the engine or the typical dashboard of a car and bringing that out into the internet and doing analysis on this. So something we're doing at Dash that drivers really respond to is uh, one of the sensors we're reading is the battery voltage of the car. And so we take this and we've got machine learning on, on top of that to do some regressions and figure out, okay, it looks like your battery may be draining and you may not be able to start your car in a week. And so instead of 
waking up right before work, try to start in your car, it doesn't start, and now you have to deal with it. Now you can have a week lead time and kind of say, okay, I'll fix this on the weekend. I won't ruin my morning. And so some of these smarts that uh, the kind of wider outside world uh, uh, we're, we're becoming more familiar with with other services, we're bringing that to the data inside the car. Yeah, uh, you always steal my line. <laughs> um, That's why I sat here first. <laughs> um, no, I, I agree with my, with my colleagues. So basically the cars, as we see them, are, are in a way driving silos of information if they're disconnected. And, and you need to bring this information somewhere to make them smarter. And um, an interesting case um, that we're working on also is, is electric vehicles. Now, people all, often question themselves, does an electric vehicle make sense? How am I going to save money with it? But if you look at the data coming from these cars, actually in our analysis, we see that 95% of trips that are done are less than 40, 50 kilometers, which means that everybody can make a case for themselves for an electric car. And these are, these, this is information that we don't get in a disconnected world, so it needs to be connected. Yeah, I, I agree with, uh, with all what was said. I would add something to that. Um, I think, you know, right now there's one billion cars on the planet. Those cars, they are utilized 4% of the time. Uh, that's uh, $20,000 billion of assets that are sitting in parking spaces more than 23 hours a day. And when you think it that way, it's probably one of the most inefficient assets there is. <laughs> And so the opportunity I see with connected cars, whether, you know, connected, uh, um, as Carl, you described, within the car itself or through the smartphone of the person who's driving that car, um, doesn't matter that much to me, at least at this stage. But what I see is the opportunity, uh, you know, when those cars become data points on a map to actually uh, utilize them way more efficiently. And I think this is what Uber is about. Uh, it's about telling you, hey, you know, if you're going from A to B every day in a car, you might well press a button and get a car that's after you is going to drop other people around. And I think that's, that's the real game-changing thing that's going on in the, in the car industry right now. Can I, can I just jump in? On this? So there's, from uh, Jaguar Land Rover perspective, uh, on the connected car, we focus quite a bit. So we've talked about uh, customer features. We've talked about business to business, sort of like enabling data uh, after sales service. From us, for us, it's also about uh, business transformation. So there's essentially three pillars, really, customer features, business to business and business transformation. And why should the car be connected? Well, okay, focusing on customer features allows us to drive revenue and actually provide, provide argument within the business that actually cars should be connected. But for us as well, it's starting to transform the way that we do, we do business, when we, how we pull data back off the vehicles, how we engineer the vehicles, we understand more about customer insights. Are we over-engineering our gearbox, for example? Um, or uh, and also, you know, as I say, we get these customer insights. So it really is transforming the business. A, a simple example um, that I keep giving to anybody who will listen when I, when I um, do my little speech by the car. But a very simple example is that we know where our cars are uh, when they're getting uh, built and when they get delivered to dealers. Um, the dealers don't always tell them when they're, when they're delivered. So we don't know when to invoice. So actually now we do know when to invoice because we know when they've taken delivery because we're tracking them. So that's three weeks of money in our bank, not theirs. And it's just a sim simple example, but it's the way that our business is also being transfer transformed as well by the connected car. Yeah. So, so, so the, the first point seems to be that the automobile industry operates a lot like the software industry operated uh, before we had internet pushed updates. You would release a product in the form of a CD-ROM. Someone would put it on their computer and then, I don't know, and then you put another one out eventually. Um, and so transitioning for you guys to a point where you have this continuous interaction, it's yeah. more than just infotainment, navigation, and maps. It's learning about the car on the road, learning about how yeah. people use it, learning about where people use it. There's, there's so much information that you guys are getting now that you didn't used to be getting, both internally in terms of shipping and in terms of consumer activity. Yeah, absolutely. So it's about what we're looking for from, a, from the connected car or is how we differentiate ourselves. Uh, from a digital perspective. I mean, the cars sort of like differentiate themselves anyway from the competition, but it's how we differentiate in that space, how we enable um, third parties. Um, we can't do everything ourselves and we shouldn't do everything ourselves. Um, it's not our expertise. We, we make good cars. Um, it's about seamlessly um, enabling uh, customers to sort of bring in their devices and just have a, a, a generally a, a seamless um, experience. And then it's about the data and how we utilize that data either through business-to-business -business services, customer insights, or business transformation. 
And if I may add, uh, there's another pillar for car makers also with uh, suppliers like uh, Bosch. Uh, with uh, connected car, we will be able to have uh, information about some components. Uh, in the past, uh, car makers design and put specifications for the different products which were then manufactured by suppliers, assembled by car makers, without knowing in field, re really, you have just written field on, on problems, but you don't know uh, at today uh, for uh, the different components, what's the behavior during the lifetime for 15 years in the car. So this will have also big impact on uh, product specification uh, in the future. So, so, so it seems like there's a lot of, so, so I, I mean, the automobile industry is in flux. Um, we're at a point where we have unconnected cars that are being, for lack of a better term, hacked into being connected cars, either initially by smartphones or now by using the, say it again, the port, the port. OBD, that, diagnostic port. OBD. OBD. I will forget this in 12 minutes and I will ask it again. Um, so, so we've got two different ways that we've done that. Either consumers have brought smartphones, uh, companies like Uber have supplied drivers with smartphones, enabling all, any car to be a connected car, uh, or, uh, or we've got this OBD, see it took me 12 seconds, port. Um, but then down the road, at the same time, car manufacturers are saying that they want cars to be connected. Uh, and even Uber is saying they want less cars on the road, or not want, they expect that if U Uber's vision is a world in which we go from 1 billion to 4% of that, or something in the middle, somewhere between 4% of the number of cars that are on the road and 100%. On of that, I think it's an interesting point because I, I'm, I'm not totally sure that the, car, the number of cars themselves is going to move down. What I know for a fact is that congestion is going to move down. Right now, there's probably 20% of the cars you see that are looking for a parking space. So this is going to move down. What I know as well is that I bet the utilization of the car, because it's going to be way, way more utilized, cars are going to be renewed more often, which means you're going to be able to push new technologies faster. So I, I'm actually quite bullish on, on, the, on the potential for cars to become even more of an attractive way to move around for people, especially when you think that you know, by sharing cars like we do with apps like Uber, um, we, we start to segment the usage of the car in city, outside cities, yeah. and, and that means different technologies can apply to different type of usage and so suddenly you can have electric cars in cities and, and so I think this eventually will tell us whether the miles driven by people in cars is going to increase or not. And, and it seems like interestingly enough that that vision whether whether you know assuming it comes to fruition uh, it doesn't negatively impact automobile suppliers because you guys get more cars being bought more sooner so a more Apple-esque uh, rollout strategy where every new car is an opportunity for the same person to, to re-up. Uh, the, the, the players supplying to the automobile industry aren't hurt because they're still the same cars. Uh, the players building on top of the connected car aren't hurt because people are still using them and you get more vertical segments, more needs, more requests for data and services on top. And of course Uber wins because everyone's Uber enabled. No, so I, it, I, it seems like a, a, a wonderful future. That no, we're I don't in. agree with you. We're, this yeah. is a disruption because if, if you think that people uh, will uh, not on cars, or let's say ownership will decrease because some people will use Uber or blah blah car and so on. Let's say uh, so first there would be less cars sold. Uh, perhaps uh, you you spoke about the park, uh, car park. Okay, it could be one billion. It could be uh, uh, because there are some countries like India, like China, very dynamic. So the car park could continue to increase. But if you look, for example, at France. Uh, uh, or Italy during the last years, car park reduced a little bit. Yeah, but that's, okay. there's a lot of reasons. I mean, yeah, France yeah. doesn't have a lot of money right now, yes. and the first so thing people it, stop buying is new cars. Uh, uh, solutions like Blablacar, like Uber. So let me just finish. If these solutions continue to develop, then uh, dealership will sell less cars. So, for example, uh, uh, the dealership uh, would be affected uh, by uh, the, UJ, uh, the u usage uh, of cars instead of car ownership. So yes, there will be impacts uh, for car dealership, for repair, so there will be some uh, uh, dealership uh, who, which will close their doors, it's I clear. Think, I think just on that, at the end of the day, it's going to depend on what is the total kilometers that are being driven by people in cars on a yearly basis. And if you assume that because cars are getting more efficient, this can actually move up. And, and so that's why I'm saying it's not necessarily the case. I don't, I don't think so. It's, it's hard to guess. 
but it's not that obvious because, as I said, those cars are going to be renewed way more often. So the only thing, you know, if, if kilometers driven every year stays flat over 20 years, uh, the only impact on cars would be the fact that, indeed, you might not have any more this, the, the, the effect of having cars that are being thrown to the, to the bin without being fully utilized. And so, indeed, there could be a, a decrease driven by that. But at the end of the day, I think the key factor is how many kilometers are being driven in cars every year. And if you feel that cars are going to be more efficient, electric, and, and are going to be a better way to move around for people, I don't think they're going to move down. I think the, use of the, the consumer base is going to change. Maybe there's going to be more fleet people buying big, big you know, amount of cars. Uh, there's definitely going to be a technology challenge with autonomous vehicles and all of that. But I don't, I, I, again, I, I think car is going to be, it become an even, an even more efficient way for people to move around. I think everything in this uh, space is evolving. Everything is changing. And it's not about anymore about buying a car, having a car. The whole, from getting point A to point B is totally different now. And, and, and what all of us, I think, here are doing is really changing the way mobility is perceived and delivered. And you know, each from a different perspective, like Uber, it, a totally new concept. And you know, us being in the connected car space, we're basically enabling these new business models uh, for companies to, to do that. And it's not about owning an asset, driving an asset from here to there. It's about getting there. And how we get there, we want to get there comfortably and efficiently. And, and that's what, you know, and it's the whole change of concept. And also talking about dealerships, dealerships are changing now. Uh, they're not building houses, they're building digital dealerships. It's, not, it's about, you know, okay, I look at the car somewhere, but how I process, how I buy it, it's, it's, it's a totally different uh, concept now. So everything is changing. Com coming back to the core asset of the car, is, are, are things, uh, not necessarily like Uber, but this changing use uh, of cars, do you internally see that as a threat, as an opportunity? Uh, it seems like the car is going from a product to oh, a service right now, and, and the next step after a service is a platform. Uh, so is there an opportunity for there to be the app store of Jaguar where you guys say, okay, maybe, maybe cars are being used more often. That means the use cases are going to grow, which means maybe you guys want to get inside. You know, do you look at building app stores on top of the connected car or do you look at leveraging existing app stores and, and creating dealership uh, partnerships with, I don't know, Brillo or whatever new uh, Internet of Things uh, operating system comes out? Uh, well, that's a good question. In terms, of the, um, in terms of app stores, um, I think our strategy will be, will be about enabling um, third-party um, third devices. And like I say, we want to take a slice of Jaguar Land Rover um, differentiation and add some value on top of, the, um, on top of the, the, the generic offering that can be provided by, uh, by apps and, and, and app stores. So I think that's the way that we would see this. It's about enabling consumers to use their devices within the vehicle um, and also providing that seamless integration um, of their devices. I, I think uh, uh, Jaguar Land Rover is perhaps not the best car maker to answer to your question because Jaguar Land Rover are premium brands. Okay? Yeah, they are. So uh, 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 when you have premium brands, let's say uh, they are customers by a status symbol. Uh, if you speak about some uh, affordable cars, affordable car brands, uh, in this case, yes, a new way of mobility uh, like Uber, like BlaBlaCar, like Drivey, and so on, uh, hurt this, uh, these brands. So the, the future of car is different also if you discuss about premium brands or affordable brands, because if you buy a 10,000 euros new car, uh, perhaps you could think, why should I continue buying that car and own that car? I could move to other uh, 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 solutions, mobility solutions. But if you buy a 40,000 uh, euros uh, Jaguar or Land Rover, perhaps you don't care and you, you will continue to use your car. Uh, I don't think we can be, afford to be complacent. So I'd just like to uh, I say that. I mean, yes, certainly we're a premium brand. Uh, we have premium brands. Um, but we have to look at the way that the, uh, the market is moving as well and, and, and take stock of that. So uh, I wouldn't like to sit here and, um, uh, and be perceived that we're, yeah. we're arrogant and say... <laughs> we are living on cloud nine. Hey, it's fine, you know. And now the peasant, <laughs> the peasant automakers look up to yeah. us, yeah. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. um, so, so there's two things that I, that I want to touch on. One is um, what we've seen in the smartphone market is uh, cheap, inexpensive does not, cannot equal cheap. 
Samsung's success has been imitating premium at a lesser cost. And so one sentiment that I have about the car industry is if you're making cheap looking cheap cars and there's another alternative that is a good looking cheap car, like, I don't know, like a Volkswagen, um, <laughs> then, <laughs> then you might be in trouble if you're, you know, uh, I won't name alternative brands. Um, so so I, I think part of that plays into it, which I think brands come and brands go, and, and, and I think the consumer has gotten to a point where cheap shouldn't, you know, inexpensive shouldn't necessarily equal cheap. Uh, even Mozilla saw this in the last few years with Mozilla OS. Uh, they tried to put out a, a big competitor to Android, and, and they, went, they went for the bottom line. They said, we want to be the cheapest phones because we're going to go to emerging countries, and emerging people want cheap stuff because they're emerging countries, and that didn't work out because it turns out people want good stuff. Uh, even if it, you know, independent of cost. Um, so so there, there's that where I, I, I think the auto, uh, and, I, and I think that comes back to the automobile industry starting to look a lot more like the computer industry as it becomes a lot more a computer industry. It, I, it is largely still a, a auto industry, but there is this, this, this transformation. We're, we're not comparing megabytes and uh, brake horsepower just yet. But, not yeah, yet. But, <laughs> but, but soon enough, yeah, I, th I think that, but, you know, that will be, that will be a, but a conversation. But when I, when I hear auto geeks talk and I hear computer geeks talk, I understand both of them equally little. Despite all of my hardware love, I know very little about the processor in anything that I own, uh, let alone the unit of measurement of a processor. Gigahertz, right? Is it, is it giga? Okay, mega? I don't know. So, let, or horsepower. I don't know what is a good amount of horsepower. So, so the, I do still see the comparison. Um, so, uh, I think you, you could even go further than what you said. First point is the average age of new car buyers in France or generally in Europe is over 50 years old. Wow. Okay? Cool. And uh, second awesome. point is, uh, uh, if, if we speak about smartphone, what you said, uh, now, there were some brands in the past, like uh, Ericsson, like Nokia, like Alcatel, like Sagem, like Siemens, which disappeared. So who drives the world of smartphone? OS, operating systems, not hardware. And you, you, have, you have had a shift from, uh, from brands, making phones to tier ones like suppliers like Foxconn making smartphones and then you have uh, the OS which became the brand. So, so I think the freight for car makers in, a f in the future is will we see uh, uh, like smartphone a differentiation or between brands and or operating system brands and manufacturers. Mr. Gunn, CEO of Renault Nissan, said, I don't want to make car frames for operating system suppliers or, or manufacturers. Uh, so you, you see already that freight. And uh, this is the logic of smartphone. Will this be the future of car industry? That's a question. I've been in a few discussions in the past few weeks, and, and one thing that was common to all of them was this discussion. So where's the, where's the bridge between the car as the asset and the, and, and, and the software? And everybody said what the, what the car is becoming is it's the iPad on wheels, and the consumers are going to be the ones picking the applications, the favorite navigation system, you know, how I consume information from my car. And, and that's where I believe the industry is going, and, and you know, holding on to, 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 to that your own application is going, to be, is going to be difficult because the consumers are going to decide what they want on the dashboard of their car and how they want to use the car. And, and to kind of uh, go off that analogy of uh, the transition from certain cell phone makers to now it's really Apple and these Android operating systems, some of that, though, is the added features on top of it, right? It's not just a device that I make a call. The car isn't just going to be a device where I drive. It's going to be what else can I do with this car? You know, is it about the design and the, the you know, open road and things like this? Is it about the applications I use inside of it? Is it a commuter car? Do I really not care? It just has to get me there. But while I'm being gotten there, I need to do things and interact and, and still do work and things like this. And so you're going to see all these added things on top of the car, and it's not just the wheels anymore. And it seems like different consumers will go down different roads. I know people who, for a phone, it is a device that gets a task done. Yeah. And for other people, it is a status symbol, the same way the car has been and will continue to be. The only question is, 
where's the money going? Is the money still, is the same amount of money still going to the car manufacturer? Is some of it trickling into the service providers? Is that added value or is that, or is that cannibalizing a different market? Uh, are there less cars being made? And, and then what do we do when cars are autonomous? We don't need drivers anymore, but that's a whole different subject. It, certainly there's going to be an impact. I mean, we make some revenue off selling navigation. That, that's going to get taken away, no doubt, with, um, uh, with Google Maps or, or whatever, and, 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 and that's the way it is. Um, so having lived through the, um, and, and being a, a, a mobile phone guy um, for 16 years, I've lived through the whole smartphone and the democratization of the, uh, of the OS, etc. cetera. Um, I think, again, without being um, um, complacent, there is this, this slight differentiation with the automotive industry whereby you do have that brand, you have that passion, and it's the most illogical purchase you can actually make is, 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 buying, a, is buying a vehicle, really, um, with the depre depreciation, but actually people still invest in, in, in vehicles because of that. And so, yes, of course, the, um, the consumer will choose what, which, uh, which products it, it, it uses within it, but that's, that's a small part of the value of, a, of an automated vehicle. So I'm not overly concerned about, about that impacting the, the, the industry. Yeah, it's perhaps a, a small part of the value, but it can be the margin. What do you guys think? Where, where, what, are we, what are we looking forward to? What are we going to see in, in three years? Uh, our cars are going to be smarter. Um, cars sure. are going to be more efficiently used, hopefully. We'd like both, both in terms of gas mileage and, and, and ecological impacts, in terms of the amount of time people spend on the road. Uh, what are the opportunities now? Because whenever things are shifting, whenever the tectonic plates of an industry are, are moving around, there's opportunity for something to, to squeeze in. So what are the opportunities? What are the, what are the caution signs? I think the, 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 the whole kind of concept, will, will, I'm, we won't buy cars anymore, we'll buy mobility. And uh, how, we'll, you know, how we'll do that, uh, we'll do it with similar assets as we do today, but we definitely won't be, I think, buying cars. We'll buy, like we buy mobile subscriptions today, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll buy cars and mobility in a similar, in a similar fashion, I think, uh, in the future. And that's, I think, where it's going. Yeah, uh, I definitely agree with that. Uh, some of the, uh, the things I can think of still in the idea of, um, of moving towards um, shared ownership of cars or like cars on demand. Uh, if you take the example of Drivey, which I think you were mentioning, for instance, uh, imagine when suddenly it's super easy for anyone to open a car just because there's a Drivey app on the car uh, that suddenly unlocks uh, a big bottleneck or a big hurdle that there is today in Drivey, which is that you have to meet the guy, the owner, and, and so on. And so suddenly, as more and more cars become connected, I think there's potential for taking off some of those hurdles in the, in the sharing of the asset. Another example I can think of is like imagine a blah, blah car app where you know you don't have anything to do with BlaBlaCar, you're just driving back to Lyon, and suddenly there's a pop-up that tells you, hey, you can amortize you know, 12 euros of your fuel by taking this guy who's sitting next to you. And so there's a potential for suddenly uh, a lot of more opportunities to share uh, than, uh, than there are today. Uh, I think uh, car owners uh, uh, will have much more opportunities like uh, uh, we have just discussed right now. Let's say consumers will have generally more opportunities. They could still buy cars, own cars, or they could go swift, uh, shift to uh, mobility models, uh, whatever is a model, uh, Uber, uh, blah, blah, car, drivey, and so on. So I think there are much more opportunities in the future uh, with cars than in the past, because uh, cars were not smart, but also people were not smart thanks to the smartphone. They, uh, people are smarter because they are connected, because they, they, they have thousands of opportunities just next to their phone. So uh, uh, this future is very important and about the car itself, the product is itself will be smarter for sure. Today you need still a physical key to open the car and this is clearly uh, an issue for uh, developing mobility business models. And in the future, you will see car open just through smartphone because you will give or you will transfer some rights to open your car or other cars if it's in fleet management through the smartphone. So the digitalization of cars 
is on the way. And this will change and even accelerate mobility businesses in the future. And regarding um, security, uh, there's Euro and Cape uh, in Europe, and uh, if you want to have five stars uh, in the future, which is a maximum rating in terms of security for your cars, by 2017, you will need to have 100% of cars equipped with automatic emergency braking. It means that all cars, in this case, will be equipped with sensors, like radar, like video camera, and these sensors can understand the world around the car. So it will change as well the car, because at today, the car does not understand by itself uh, the world around it. But in the future, uh, cars will, be, uh, will sensor the world and will be even able to share this live information about its surroundings to platforms. And this will bring as well new opportunities, for example, just for parking I identification in the street. Thanks to the front camera, you will be able to see if there are empty spots. And you could share this information live uh, to uh, vehicles surrounding you if somebody is looking for a parking spot. And you're right, 20% of cars just around us are looking for a parking slot. But if we bring uh, intelligence and we share this information, this will give value to everybody, to the community. Yeah, and I think uh, all those smarts in a word are convenience. So whether it's you don't want to own a car, but you still want the mobility that a car offers, there are services that are providing that. Whether you do want a car, you like driving, I enjoy driving, I want to continue to drive. And so in driving, though, it might be more convenient for me to have services that tell me where to park or tell me what restaurants along my route, you know, are, are good or something that I would like. And so this convenience will be brought to us from the sensors, from the services, and uh, I think uh, it'll be very uh, great to still be a driver. It'll be fun. Final thoughts? You mentioned about, um, about our margin. <laughs> so this IoT node that is the car, which is all these sensors um, providing all this data back, there are new revenue opportunities uh, and new business cases and new um, partnerships that will form throughout this connected car. Final thought. Perfect. I, and as final word, I, I think cars connected will be a data broker in the future. And this changed completely. Awesome. Well, you guys, thanks for taking the time to chat. Uh, I really appreciate all the different points of view on this. And uh, let's give our panelists a round of applause. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Yeah.